Dr. Schuster, could you please tell us uh, about your present professional affiliation and your title? Sure. Uh, currently, I am a senior research scientist here at the Addiction Research Center, which is the intramural research program of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I see. And how long have you held this position? I came here uh, about a year and a half ago after having been the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse since 1986. Uh, I remember it well because it was my birthday. I gave, uh -huh. I gave uh, myself a birthday present, and that is I went back to do research. <laughs> I see. Okay. Your other work had been more largely administrative. Is that yes, right? from yes. 86 to, to 92, uh, mm -hmm. as the director at NIDA, I was a government administrator. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Now, do you have any other official positions at present? No, um, uh, and, uh, not currently. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you describe yourself as a professional if a high school student asks you what you do for a living? I, you know, I have to say something, and that is that I, I'm incorrect. I am the editor of the new APA journal oh, called okay. Experimental and Clinical Psychopharmacology, and oh. we're having our first edition. Uh, we just put it to bed, and it will be coming out in October. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, how do you describe yourself as a professional? If a high school student, say, asked you what you do for a living, what would you tell them? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say that I'm trying to use science, the science of psychology, and in my case, the science of pharmacology, to try and solve some of the most fundamental problems associated with drug addiction. And I have been blessed in my own personal career with having attacked that uh, problem of drug addiction from the most fundamental level of laboratory research uh, through treatment uh, and even into community kinds of prevention mm -hmm. and using my skills as a behavior analyst and psychologist in all of those in all of those various uh, arenas but the big thing is trying to use science to solve a pressing social problem. Do you consider yourself to be a behaviorist? Oh, yes. And a yes. behavior analyst? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, uh, what about your previous professional affiliations? Before you uh, came to NIDA, what, what were you doing? Well, I had uh, spent about 18 years at the University of Chicago from 68 to 86, mm -hmm. I was there, uh, in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and uh, I had appointments in pharmacology as well as the psychology department there. Were you teaching there? I was teaching, uh, but also we had there a very large drug abuse research center, which I was the director of. Mm -hmm. And it involved n many people who were behavior analysts, uh, Jim Appel, who was there at that time, um, Izzy Golddiamond uh, was there and so forth and so it was it was a center without walls so mm -hmm. we, we we could we could incorporate anybody we wanted to into the uh, into the center and of course they were very active in it uh, it was a very exciting period of time because the University of Chicago was a hotbed of of both um, behavior an analysis through people like Izzy Gold Diamond and Jim Appel uh, but as well uh, a great deal of controversy about it because there were a number of psychologists there who didn't <laughs> like what we did at that. all. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what were the uh, dates of your uh, work, uh, work there at uh, Chicago? Uh, I came there in 1968 and uh, stayed until 1986. Mm -hmm. And, and I, was on was your, I was on leave of absence yeah. up until recently, but they finally, they finally kicked finally, me out. <laughs> they gave up on you. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, I wasn't so coming, you back. coming back. Right. Uh, what was your title then during that period? Of time? Well, I was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry uh, and Pharmacology and what they called Behavioral Sciences. They didn't have a Psychology Department. Oh, it was a Behavioral yeah. Sciences Department. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I'd like to uh, know a little more about um, Charles Schuster, or Bob Schuster, I guess. Yeah, that's what my <laughs> friends call me. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about your early background, where you grew up and went to high school? Sure. Well, I was born in Camden, New Jersey, right on the main street. And I have to say that if, if anybody who has read the national newspaper, national magazines, knows that my hometown 
has now deteriorated to the point that it looks like the worst of third world countries. It's bombed out and so forth. And uh, my grandfather owned a city block on the main street, which had been where we had our uh, Schuster's Market, which was a, a big market that, that uh, folded in the uh, uh, late depression. But so I grew up in the city. Uh, <laughs> it was sort of interesting because uh, I lived on the main street, one block in one direction. It was all Italian Americans. One block in the other direction, it was all African Americans. <laughs> and I was neither black nor Italian, so I spent my childhood playing on the roofs <laughs> in the one block <laughs> that, that my grandfather owned. <laughs> and in the summertime, I went out to the country uh, because he had farms out there. But anyway, uh, high school was interesting because I became a jazz musician and uh, started playing in nightclubs when I was 13. Uh, that was during the war years in 1943. And everybody who uh, had a war job uh, wanted to get out on Friday and Saturday nights and have a couple of drinks. And all the older musicians were away, so I was fortunate to be able to play. And uh, as a consequence, I didn't do very well in high school. My high school grades were poor, to put it mildly. I was fortunate, however, in that my mother was a school teacher. And I had absorbed a lot from, from her and from my older sister, who was a psychology major at college while I was in high school. So when I got out of high school, I couldn't get into most colleges. So I started out by going to a local community college for two years and um, sort of left the, I continued to play, but I really left the music business. And I will tell you, in large measure, that was because many of the people that I played with in those years were getting heavily involved with drugs. Mm -hmm. And although smoking marijuana didn't bother me, uh, seeing that uh, uh, some of these kids were getting into injecting heroin, and that scared the hell out of me. And I just said, you know, uh, I don't want to be here. And so I um, proved my grades and was able to uh, uh, get into Gettysburg College, where uh, I was finally got my bachelor's degree in 1951. Well, going back just a little bit, uh, what year did you graduate from high school? 1947. 47. Right. And that was uh, from the Camden? Camden High, high school, school, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, a little bit more about your early uh, years. Uh, what hobbies and avocations did you have when you were growing up? Well, music, music was always a, a, a mm -hmm. big uh, hobby of mine. I played trumpet and I even sang a little bit. And uh, my mother was a musician mm -hmm. and a music teacher, which is mm -hmm. why I uh, had probably that interest in any talent I had. <laughs> but uh, uh, I also, my mother um, it reminded me uh, a few years ago before she died that I also used to always have pet mice. And it drove her nuts. Uh, but I would have pet mice that were always reproducing, and we didn't know what to do with them. <clears throat> but I would um, play with them, and uh, uh, I, I liked animals very much, and uh, uh, grew up in, around them because my uh, both of my grandfathers had farms, and I'd spend the summertime there. So were the mice the only animal you had as pets? Uh, actually, no. We had dogs, and a very strange pet. My father. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My father was up in the Poconos one time, and he, these kids were poking around underneath this car, and he said, what are you doing? They said, well, there's a little snake under here. Oh. So he said, oh, well, let me see. And it was a little garter snake. So he picked it up and brought it home. <laughs> and for about a year, <laughs> my mother always had flowers on the dining room table. The garter snake lived in the flowers that were in the center <laughs> of the dining room table. Once in a while, people would come over for, <laughs> for dinner, and they'd look, and suddenly they'd see this movement. <laughs> and if they weren't warned, it was uh, quite a scene. Yeah. Yes, it was. But uh, <laughs> so I had a variety of pets. Okay. <laughs> Uh, did you have any uh, career ambitions in your uh, childhood or, let's say, high school? Uh, well, one of the things, uh, my father had um, been a naturopathic doctor. Um, what happened to him was that he grew up in a relatively affluent household, and um, strangely enough, his father said, you don't have to bother going to school, you know, I've got lots of money. So he spent a Huck Finn kind of, of uh, uh, existence up until the time he went into the Army in the First World War, and he went into the Medical Corps there because he did not want to uh, bear arms. 
And uh, so he, when he got out, he uh, only had an eighth grade education. Uh, he got some kind of high school equivalency degree and ended up going to a school of naturopathy. And mm -hmm. the naturopaths were interesting because they were interested in diet, preventative health things and so forth, and uh, m very much like holistic medicine today. And he practiced that for about five or six years, well, longer than that, um, and uh, uh, up until the time I was a very young child. And uh, uh, so in, he also had all the regular medical textbooks in the house, and I used to sit and read those as a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I was very interested in reading about these diseases and so forth. Um, and then, of course, my sister, who was a great influence on me, um, uh, and is seven years older than I am, she she became a psychology gra uh, uh, major at Beaver College in in Philadelphia, and uh, uh, talking about that all the time, and that really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. That really intrigued me. Uh, uh, all right, where did you first go to college? Well, I went to I went to a community college uh, called the College of South Jersey, which was in Camden, mm -hmm. and it was a two-year school. Uh, now it's been it's been taken on by as an affiliate of Rutgers University, but at the time it was a freestanding two-year community college that had been developed before the first Second World War uh, as a means of giving two years to people who wanted to go to law school at night, and then after the war, when all the veterans returned, they suddenly had. Uh, an affluent business, so mm -hmm. they, they they packed people in and they they took over. We our 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 classes were in local churches, mm -hmm. and and so forth around in the community, and they and they would get people from Temple and the University of Pennsylvania who were either retired or who wanted to teach extra to come over from there and to teach us. So it was actually, um, if you wanted to, you could get a pretty good education there. Mm -hmm. so. All right, and then did you get um, an associate degree from there? I got an associate degree from there, and then I actually spent one year at the University of New Mexico, my junior year. Uh, I got into a little bit of uh, trouble out there, so I came back and finished my bachelor's degree at Gettysburg College. What year was that? 1951. 51. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, I, well, I should say, when uh, I went back, then I... Uh, I uh, I tried to I tried to enlist in the Marine Corps. My brother-in-law, my, my sister had married a guy who had been in the Marine Corps. He was also a jazz musician, so I really mm -hmm. liked him. And how he ever survived in the Marine Corps, I don't know. But <laughs> but he uh, he was had been a, had been a captain in the Marine Corps in the Second World War. So after I finished college, I decided, well, I'm going to enlist. It was the Korean War. I'm going to enlist in the Marine Corps, and I could go in directly as an officer uh, or to OCS school. Mm -hmm. And I went and I took the physical and I was all set and I reported and they said, oh, we didn't do a dental exam. Did a dental exam and found out I was missing a molar on one side and a Marine Corps officer had to be absolutely physically perfect. They would not take me with a missing molar. So there I was, I was out of, I was, had no plans and I um, uh, it was facing the draft mm -hmm. if I didn't go into the Marine Corps and I sure didn't want to do that so I called up some friends at the University of New Mexico, and they had a master's degree program there in psychology. And I said, I'm coming out, and they accepted me. And I went out and, uh, in 51 and, and uh, started graduate school at the University of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you're, um, uh, when you graduated uh, from Gettysburg College, uh, were you a psychology major? I was a psychology mm -hmm. major and, and biology, mm -hmm. uh, both. Okay. And, uh, that's, uh, you didn't have a minor subject then, is that? Sociology. Oh, sociology, mm -hmm. all right. Yep. And was that, what kind of a degree did you get? Was that a BA or BS? Uh, it, was, it was a BA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now here you are um, in beginning graduate school. Uh, what are your career goals at this point? Did you have any? Uh, my career goals at that point were to stay out of the Army. A goal you share uh, with me. Right, <laughs> yes. Well, actually, I'm, you know, I tried to enlist in the yeah, Marine Corps, okay. but I, uh, no, I, I was. I knew I was very interested in the interface of biology, and and uh, behavior. Um, I had been blessed at the at, at Gettysburg College in my senior year with some a couple of really good teachers, 
and uh, they had really turned me on in terms mm -hmm. of, of uh, psychology. At that time, I certainly was not a behaviorist in, this, in, in any formal sense, but uh, I, we were intrigued by the theories of Hull and, and, mm -hmm. and Tolman and, and all those kinds of people, which were very, very popular at that point. Was that your first exposure to behavioral psychology? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, really, yes. And, uh, Did they mention Skinner? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, we used um, uh, we used uh, Hilgard's theories of learning, and you know, with the various <laughs> chapters in there, and I and uh, uh, so I, I I found that intriguing. And uh, at the same time, I had some good biology classes, and the University of New Mexico was fortunate for me because uh, there was uh, the head of the department there was a man by the name of George Maxwell Peterson, who was a physiological psychologist. He had been a student of Carl Lashley's at the University of mm -hmm. Chicago and had discovered that with less than 1% destruction of the cortex in a specific region, rats would shift their dominant handedness. So the, the, he, had, he had discovered mm -hmm. the center in the brain that controlled mm -hmm. handedness. So I did some, for my master's thesis, I did some funny study in which I cut the corpus callosum, which is of course the largest mm -hmm. f tract in the central nervous system to see whether or not that would influence the handedness of rats. And it didn't. And then I tried to find out whether it did anything. And as far as I was concerned, it was useless. And then uh, years later, Sperry came along and covered up the eye of one animal and, and showed all these great and wondrous things. <laughs> but uh, that's what I did for my master's thesis. You were very yeah. close to a Nobel Prize. That's there, right. Didn't <laughs> that's I didn't get it. Well, oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, that's right. So now you have a master's, uh, MA. And no, I had a Master's of Science. MS, yes, yes. Uh, from right. the University of New Mexico. Right, exactly. Okay, and what was the date of that? And that would have been 53. 53. Now, where do you go from here? Well, I had gotten married while I was in graduate school. And uh, by the time I had finished my degree, I had a, uh, uh, a baby. And uh, that did two things. Um, it gave me additional responsibilities, but it also it also meant that I was no longer subject to the draft. So mm -hmm. I did not immediately go back to school. Uh, I came to the East Coast, back to uh, where I grew up, and uh, took a job at Temple Medical School as an assistant instructor in endocrine biology. Mm -hmm. Now you know. Uh, it, 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 and I didn't know anything about really about endocrinology, but I talked my way into this, and it, it only paid two hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. So they weren't looking for. <laughs> they didn't want very much. <laughs> they didn't want very much, but it was fantastic because within three months, a guy by the name of uh, Bernard Zandek, who was an Israeli physician who he, he displaced from Germany by the Second World War, but Israeli physician who had discovered estrogen and was the father of the original Asheim Zondek pregnancy test, which was the pregnancy test in, in uh, mice or rats. He came to the United States to work at Temple as a visiting scientist for a year, and they assigned me as his research assistant. And so I worked with him, and he said, Ach, my boy, your future is assured. You have worked with Zondek. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I said, okay. Uh, well, uh, it, uh, I didn't learn a great deal about science from him. Uh, but I, I, I did learn um, a lot about endocrinology and, and about <laughs> world politics and things. <laughs> okay. so. um, all right, uh, well, then. Uh, well, let uh, me uh, let me uh, tell you that of okay. course I was starving uh, on two hundred and twenty-five dollars okay. a month with <laughs> a wife and baby. <laughs> or yeah. wife and baby, yes. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, um, uh, a, I heard about I saw an advertisement in the newspaper wanting a junior scientist at Smith, Klein, and French laboratories. Mm -hmm. They were establishing a, I forget what they called it, but some type of psychopharmacology lab. And I said, hey, mm -hmm. I want to look into this. And I went down there. And this would have been in about 1955, 56. And uh, they had just bought chlorpromazine from Rone Polanc in France, which was the, one of the first mm -hmm. drugs that specifically was used for the therapy of a mental disease, namely mm -hmm. schizophrenia. And they realized 
because after they bought it, they, they, they spent a year preparing the psychiatric profession, which was largely controlled by psychoanalysts, spent a year educating them about the possible role of medications for the treatment of the mentally mm -hmm. ill. And after that, when they started to sell it, within three months, they had made back all that they had invested in, in purchasing mm -hmm. this drug mm -hmm. from the French company, Rone Planck. And they said, hey, this, this looks like a real bonanza business. How do we find new drugs that affect mental disease? Well, pharmacologists were there. They said, we do heart or we do kidney studies, et cetera. They had no idea what to do. And along came a guy by the name of Don Bullock. Uh, Don Bullock uh, was a psychologist trained at Columbia University by uh, the behaviorist analyst there. Uh, Don was a polio victim. He was paralyzed from the waist on down. And uh, he had been at uh, University of Buffalo, and he wanted to come back to Philadelphia, which is where his family was. So he came to Smith, Klein, and French and gave a talk about how they could use uh, behavior analytic techniques in animals to screen for psychoactive drugs that might be useful for the treatment of, of mental disorders. and. They said, well, sounds interesting, but um, we can't hire a psychologist. So instead of that, they gave him a grant and allowed him to work in the building. And they gave us an old dog room in the back of the lab. So I mean, we didn't get a laboratory. We got a, a dog room that had been used for dog storage. And the first thing that we did was to uh, get, some, get, get a few experiments going. And oh, it was hard and tough getting things or we, uh, equipment wasn't, you couldn't just go and order it. You had to build it yourself. And, and so he hired me to come and be his assistant, and I learned how to wire up relays and, you know, do all that kind of thing. And the next thing we did was to hire Charlie Furster as our consultant. Charlie Furster was at Yerkes at that time, and he would come up to consult with us. Uh, and we, um, I was there for about six months when um, Dr. Bullock uh, left the company. Um, I guess it's fair to say that they asked him to leave because Don was a very brilliant person, but he uh, didn't know that in industry you didn't correct your boss in front of his boss and survive very long. So after six months they mm -hmm. said, would you please leave? And I came in the next Monday and said, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, and they said, well, why aren't the animals running? You're in charge. <laughs> so there I was in charge of one of the first psychopharmacology laboratories mm -hmm. in industry. And I said, what do you mean I'm in charge? I mean, they said, well, do it. So for two years, I ran it and um, uh, with Charlie Furster as a consultant and other people, uh, Carl Preburn. And uh, we kept expanding it and uh, we were doing a lot of interesting things. And well, what was the time period here? When, when well, this would have been 56 to 58. And at that point, they, we, uh, Grayson Stadler Company started to manufacture equipment. You no longer had to wire it up yourself, which was a blessing. And we put in an order for an incredible amount. <laughs> I mean, something like $22,000 worth of equipment, which at that time <laughs> was a huge amount. And uh, then the company said, you go, well, that's fine, but you mean you don't have a PhD in charge of this laboratory and you're ordering all that equipment? <laughs> and so they hired Roger Kelleher, yeah. uh, who was like another behavior analyst, uh, to come. And he, t he came in to, to uh, become the lab chief. Mm -hmm. And I left to go back to graduate school. And I was very fortunate because Joe Brady had been the Sigma Psi lecturer that year. And he'd come to Philadelphia. And uh, uh, I talked to him, and he said, well, if you, if you ever want to go back to graduate school, uh, why don't you consider the University of Maryland, where he was a part-time professor, because he was in the Army, but he was also a part-time professor there. And I said, OK. Called him up and uh, went there mm -hmm. as an assistant. I, I went there, actually, as an instructor. But the fact of the matter is that Joe, <laughs> God bless him, he and Sherman Ross had gotten a grant to set up the first academic psychopharmacology lab. And they didn't even know you had to have an analytic balance to weigh out <laughs> drugs, because they didn't know anything about <laughs> drugs. And I had worked 
in the pharmaceutical industry for two and a half years. And, you know, I was the big authority about drugs. So I came there, and instead of being just a regular graduate student because I had that extra advantage, they made me an instructor. And that allowed me to go back to graduate school because, of course, mm -hmm. by this time, I had two children. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, not one. And, uh, uh, now, what year was this that you went back there? I, uh, 58. 58, 58. Yeah. Uh, What kind of animals did you use at Smith, Klein, and French? Ah, well, we used rats, and I had rhesus monkeys. Mm -hmm. had about four or five rhesus monkeys, mm -hmm. but we had lots and lots of rats. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and at that time, we were running the one procedure that had sort of been shown by Joe Brady and others to be sensitive to drugs, the what's called now the Geller-Seifter punishment procedure. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the CER, the Conditioned Emotional Response by Furster and, and uh, um, by Skinner and, and Estes. Uh, mm -hmm. And we ran 15-minute <laughs> sessions seven, uh, with rats who were trained to, to be repressed uh, for um, food reinforcement. And then to seven minutes, a tone would come on for three minutes and it terminated by a brief electric shock and then five minutes after that. And I had maybe eight boxes and every 15 minutes I was putting in new rats. We ran maybe a hundred rats a day in these damn things. And I was very busy, so I had one assistant. And we were as fast as we could. We were putting rats in and taking them out and so forth and drugging them to see whether or not any of these, any drug would, rele would release the behavior that was suppressed in this so-called experimental anxiety paradigm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the primary things we did. We also looked in monkeys at um, uh, delayed matching to sample and other things that might uh, indicate that these drugs had some effect upon uh, memory or uh, uh, either to enhance it, but perhaps more importantly at that point we were interested in not marketing drugs that would uh, cause a deterioration in, in memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I meant to ask you back a ways. Um, when you started your research as a student, uh, did you use animals in your first research? Yes. And what yeah. kind of animals were those? Rats. Rats. Rats, yes. Okay, so now you've, you had done research with rats and rhesus monkeys. Right. Uh, you were in the, the work before the pigeon phase came out. Well, did you actually, use actually, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, this is a humorous story, and I have to tell you. <laughs> we <coughs> when I first went to Smith, Klein, and French, and Don Bullock was my boss. He had arranged with Skinner to have these pigeon box sent down and a couple of pigeons that were trained on multiple schedules of reinforcement. And it was a sort of a traveling road show that Skinner had put together <laughs> to, to, to uh, sell, behavior analysis, uh, to sell uh, behavior analysis. So it, they came down and, and we had these pigeons for a while. And, w and we got our own lab started, so we weren't using them. And uh, Skinner was contacted by a pharmacologist at Hahnemann Medical School who said, I'm really interested in getting into this field. And he said, well, you know, there's these pigeons over there. Why don't you take them and, and, and you can give them a few drugs and see what happens. So I took this box and the pigeons over to Hahnemann Medical School, which was only a few blocks from uh, where Smith, Klein, and French labs were, delivered them. And I forgot about it because he was supposed to send them directly back to Skinner. Well, about six months later, I got a call from the chairman of pharmacology there who said, um, uh, we got a problem. And I said, why? He said, well, those pigeons that Skinner sent down here, we killed them. He said, and we got two new pigeons and we put them in the box and they're just not behaving. <laughs> <laughs> Scouts out of this. Okay. And I said, oh, <laughs> well, tell you what, why don't you send them back over here? <laughs> yes, uh, he thought it was some, some type of innate behavior. I mean, something they did. They, on a fixed interval, they did this. On fixed ratio, they and they knew the key colors associated with it. <laughs> so. Marvelous. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Um, by the way, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, sure. you mentioned chlorpromazine as being one of the first psychoactive yes. drugs. drugs. Uh, was uh, Thorazine the name of Smith, Klein, and French's? Yes, yeah, that's many correct. Many people, Thorazine. I think, know uh, Thorazine, Thorazine was the, mm -hmm. was the uh, trade name. <coughs>
All right, now uh, you are back uh, doing your Ph.D. work now. Right. And uh, when did you get your Ph.D.? 1962. Mm -hmm. I can only say that the University of Maryland from 58 to 62 was the most exciting place that one could conceive of being. That's because Joe Brady had uh, a, a position at Walter Reed which, in which he could get bright young psychologists who were uh, facing the draft at that time to come to Walter Reed and uh, work there doing research in the division of neuropsychiatry. He was at that point the director of the psychology branch in that division. But there were other people in that division who complimented him that were marvelous. There was Wally Nauta, the very famous neuroanatomist. Uh, there was uh, Bob Galambos, who was the one that discovered mm. bats and, and their ability to navigate by uh, sonar, I guess. Uh, and uh, a person who was important to me, uh, and uh, whose name will come to me in a minute, uh, who, who uh, was doing endocrine work in stressed monkeys and had developed a procedure for putting intravenous catheters into their vein so he wouldn't stress them further by having to go in and stick them with a needle to remove blood and so he could remove the blood remotely. Anyway, from in addition to that, what happened was that um, there were people who came to Walter Reed who for one or another reason were in the Army, but Joe would send them over to the University of Maryland to spend all, all their time working in his laboratory over there. And we had a huge lab uh, that was an old army barracks kind of building. And you could do anything to it. You could knock down walls, b build mm -hmm. new ones, not like modern, you know, <laughs> not like modern labs. Mm -hmm. And so we had ultimate flexibility, and it was fantastic. Uh, people like uh, 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 Jack Findlay. Uh, were there at that time who, in my opinion, was probably one of the most brilliant and, and innovative thinkers that has ever existed in, in behavior analysis. His early work on expanding the, the operant from a single response to larger units and his whole conception of, of chains of behavior, et cetera, was, in my opinion, a major advance, one of the major advances after Skinner's work in the 30s. Um, uh, Dickie Hernstein was there. He wouldn't like me calling Dickie anymore, but <laughs> we did at that time. Uh, he was in the Army, but he was assigned over there to uh, Maryland. Stan Pliskoff was there. Uh, and just, and of course, uh, that's where I met my, uh, one of my closest colleagues there, uh, uh, Travis Thompson. Uh, and so there, it, it was just a, a really exciting place. Mm -hmm. and. I remember spending evenings until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning talking to people in the lab, and uh, it was uh, really neat. I, at that time, was uh, separated and about to get divorced from my wife, and for about two years when I was in graduate school, I had my children myself. And uh, that made it interesting because I would get up in the morning and get these two little girls ready to go off to their daycare, and uh, uh, they... Uh, uh, would get back at around 5 and I'd have to be back there and then I had arranged with a neighbor after I would get them to bed at 8, eight o'clock or 8.30 that she would be there in case they needed anything and I'd go back to the lab. <laughs> it was, uh, but I'm happy, I'm happy to have spent those years as a mother and father. Yes. It was fun. Quite an experience. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, what, by the way, what was your uh, doctoral uh, dissertation? Well, I'm laughing only because uh, not many people know about it because I published it in the Pavlov Journal of Higher Nervous Activity. Uh -oh. and unless you read Russian, <laughs> you're not going to read it. Uh, did you write it in Russian? No, I didn't. Okay. No, I didn't. Uh, that's an interesting story. I, I started out, I, I mentioned before that, that uh, at Walter Reed there was a, a neuroendocrinologist by the name of Mason uh, who uh, had developed a technique for chronically implanting jugular catheters in rhesus monkeys so that he could remove blood. And I looked at that and I said, hmm, if he can remove blood, I can put something in. And if I put it in, uh, then I ultimately I want to do that contingently, and I wonder whether or not we could get animals to self-administer drugs. 
Well, to start with, I thought, well, no healthy-minded rhesus monkey is going to voluntarily self-inject a drug. Uh, that would, why would they do that? I'm going to have to develop a technique for making drugs more interesting to them <laughs> as a reinforcer. So w the first thing that I decided to do was to see whether or not I could get drugs to act as discriminative stimuli because if they could serve as a discriminative stimulus, then they might acquire conditioned reinforcing properties. And if they were conditioned reinforcers, then maybe I could get animals to self-inject them or self-administer them. So I began doing some studies in monkeys to, uh, to study whether or not they could serve as discriminative stimuli. And I didn't use a drug to begin with because drugs are very long-acting, and I wanted to be able to run many trials a day and so I used uh, an, an, a, a neurohormone, namely uh, uh, epinephrine. And I would inject epinephrine remotely through these catheters that went into the animal. And the animal, it, when he got epinephrine as opposed to an injection of saline, he was supposed to respond on the right lever for food. If he received saline on that trial, then he was supposed to respond on the left lever. So I taught them to discriminate between an injection of epinephrine and saline. And um, at this was a period of time that Russia and, uh, you know, during, I guess it was uh, during detente, and we, uh, some Russian scientists came to visit, and they said, oh, this is fantastic. This is, you know, very much like, you know, uh, Pavlov did work with interoceptive stimulation and so mm -hmm. forth. Why don't you publish this in, in Russian, <laughs> in the Russian uh, language? And I thought, well, that, wouldn't that be neat to promote, you know, uh, better feelings between people in the United States and the Soviet Union. <laughs> so when I finally finished it, with all kinds of controls, of course, uh, which Joe insisted upon, my professor, uh, we decided to send it off to the Soviet Union. Well, I, in the meantime, took a job at the University of Michigan and uh, waited after I sent it off. I didn't hear anything. And Gregory Razrin, who was at, in New York, uh, called me one day and he said, I was in Russia this summer and they have your paper and, oh, it's marvelous. And, I, and, and they're, they're working on it. Well, th I waited another, seems like a year, <laughs> and nothing happened. And I was just about to write to Science Magazine and say, you know, it's a nice idea to try and do this. But it's a, it's a black hole. You send your paper off. And I went upstairs, and there were the reprints in Russian. They never told me it was accepted or anything else. <laughs> they just sent me the reprints in Russian. So I, uh, I, I called Gregory Razarin, and I said, did they translate it properly? <laughs> I said, and more importantly, is that my name on there? Because <laughs> I couldn't even Good tell whether it was really my name yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and Joe Brady's name. So he said, yeah, it's your name and Joe's, and, and they did a very good job of translating it. But uh, that's why nobody has ever heard of my doctoral <laughs> dissertation. <laughs> that's very sad. <laughs> but, uh, well, a few years ago, we put it into a book chapter. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, um, now, what year did you finally get your Ph.D.? In 62. 62. Okay. And that was from the University of Maryland? University of Maryland, yes. Right. All right. Um, in what, uh, going back a little bit here, uh, I realized that uh, you had encountered behavior analysis. Uh, well, let's say, when did you encounter behavior analysis first? Well, I think the first person who really talked about behavior analysis was my boss at Smith, Klein and French, Don mm -hmm. Bullock. Don he Bullock. had been trained at Columbia mm -hmm. with the uh, people there. And uh, actually, I was quite antithetical. I had been got my master's degree with a student of Carl Lashley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, talking about a black box, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, we wanted to know what was going on in the brain. And, and you know, that was the only reality. And so I um, used to argue with him, and, and, but he was, he was very smart. And mm -hmm. uh, within a few months, I became increasingly less argumentative and <laughs> appreciative of what he was saying. And then, of course, um, subsequently, uh, there was an overlap between Roger Kelleher, who came in, and, and myself. And, and uh, 
and of course uh, I mentioned that we had as a consultant Charlie Furster, mm. who, you know, of no. course, was uh, uh, gave me a lot of things to read, and whenever he came mm. up uh, in to Smith, Klein, and French, would talk to me about behavior analysis. So even before I went to graduate school, now mm -hmm. you have to understand, graduate school at the University of Maryland was was schizophrenic, in the sense that the regular faculty there, T. G. Andrews, who was one of the fathers of analysis of covariance, uh, Sherman Ross. Uh, and a lot, and uh, Bush um, and, and uh, uh, others were very, very anti behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. So, my classes <laughs> <laughs> that I took <clears throat> were with these guys, and my training was back with Dickie Herrnstein <laughs> and Stan Pliskoff and Joe Brady, et cetera, uh, uh, in, 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 in the laboratory that they had there. Uh, well, w could you put, a, let's say, a date on when you might say you finally became converted to a full-fledged, red-blooded behavior analyst? Oh yeah, when uh, in, in, in the first, I would say in the first year or two at, at 1960 uh, mm -hmm. at the latest. Okay. Yeah. What do you consider the three most Im important or influential books that you've read? Well, the first of all, I still, I, um, I still periodically. Um, uh, go back and read the first few chapters in Behavior of Organisms because I think that Skinner's conception of the units of behavior and how we fractionate the flow of behavior into meaningful, measurable units is the most important contribution that I can think of to mm -hmm. psychology. Um, the, I was also, I also have to say that uh, I was quite, quite captivated with science and human behavior because I've always had aspirations to the, for the application of behavior analysis on a grander scale than simply in a laboratory. And um, uh, so that was a very intriguing. Mentioned before in, uh, in terms of, of, was not a book, but I think that the monograph that Jack Findlay put out on multi-operant uh, uh, behavioral repertoires was also mm -hmm. very important in my thinking. Um, <coughs> and I, you know, there, there have been uh, many things that have, have occurred subsequently uh, uh, that, that uh, are of importance. But I think, I think in the early days that Behavior of Organisms and, and Jack Findlay's uh, influence on me, as well as the daily influence of Joe Brady, uh, who to this day is, uh, as you know, he would not call himself a psychologist. <laughs> he resigned from APA no, I know. <laughs> over that. <coughs> He's, um, uh, he keeps my language. Uh, reasonably uh, pure. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, were there any other uh, journal articles or books you can think of? Well, the um, I guess because of my own interest, um, there were there were people early on who were attempting to to look at the effects of of uh, drugs on on behavior, and uh, I think probably uh, Charlie Furster and and Roger Kelleher. Uh, were, were very important to mm -hmm. me with their writings. Mm -hmm. Have you done any uh, uh, research work with uh, humans, the subjects? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, when I, uh, let me just say that I, th in, I spent six years at the University of Michigan after mm -hmm. I left the, oh, uh, yeah. my graduate training and. Oh, uh, excuse me, but what year was that? 1960. To 63, I went yeah. there, okay. and I stayed till 68. <coughs> and while I was there, I was I learned pharmacology mm -hmm. really well because in in the grand tradition of medical schools at that time, all professors in the pharmacology department went to the medical school lectures in pharmacology, and we all sat in the back, and the medical students sat down there. And boy, I'll tell you, when you were the lecturer, which I was once in a while, and you knew not only the students were watching you, but guys who were trained as pharmacologists, and here I was, an imposter in the department as an assistant professor, trained in behavior analysis, et cetera, um, I paid attention. But I also had the privilege of listening to all of them and running the medical school laboratories and doing all kinds of things in pharmacology. So I learned a lot of pharmacology there. And I ran into a, a cardiovascular pharmacologist by the name of Ben Lucchese, uh, who was an MD, PhD. And we decided that we would do some studies uh, on the role of nicotine in cigarette smoking. 
And uh, since we didn't know how to make animal smoke at that time, and uh, we do it now, but we didn't then, uh, we knew we'd have to do this in humans. So I applied for and was able to get a, an American Medical Association uh, tobacco grant, it was so called at that time. And we took humans and brought them into the laboratory. These were s smokers, but they had no idea what we were studying. Put them into a cubicle, put an IV catheter into their arm, and infused either nicotine at a very slow rate or saline on different days. And they were involved in various operant tasks. And they were told, essentially, that we were interested in the operant tasks. But they, since they were in there for eight hours, uh, they were allowed to smoke. And we recorded the number of cigarettes that they smoked and as well the size of the butt that they left. We would weigh that and we looked at the effects of various doses of, of nicotine and found that in fact uh, the infusion of nicotine caused a significant decrease in the amount that they smoked and in both in terms of number and how much of each cigarette they smoked. If we had patented that, we would have made a fortune, <laughs> but we didn't uh, because, um, of course, now the nicotine patch and nicotine mm -hmm. chewing gum uh, came along and they're being used therapeutically. Mm -hmm. But that was my first experience at human research, and I was very intrigued with it. Um, and uh, when uh, Jerry Jaffe, who was the first, set up the first um, drug abuse treatment program, uh, in, in the United, a major treatment program in the United States. He took over the whole state of Illinois. Uh, he uh, heard me talk about research that I was doing in the laboratory in which we had monkeys who were self-injecting drugs, which is, I guess, what I'm most known for. Um, he was very intrigued with that and said, uh, why don't you come over and join me in the Illinois Drug Abuse Treatment Program as the Associate Director for Research and I had just done this human research, so in 1968 I left the University of Michigan and went to the University of Chicago where he had the contract, he was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and he had the contract for the in setting up the treatment programs for the entire state. And that really began my, mm -hmm. sort of my, my interest in uh, the clinical aspects of, of the problems of drug abuse, and uh, I spent about four years, uh, three or four years working with him before I founded the Drug Abuse Research Center at the University of Chicago and, and mm -hmm. continued to do human research and animal research there. Um, I believe you were the first one really to do the self-administration of drugs. Uh, am I correct about that? Well, it, it was sort of a zeitgeist phenomena in the sense that um, went back at the University of Maryland, uh, when I, after I, while I was working on my dissertation, I decided with Travis Thompson to see whether or not we could get animals to self-inject drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had these monkeys with intravenous catheters and they would sit in chairs and we'd have a lever in front of them and they could press that. And we didn't think any healthy-minded rhesus monkey was going to self-inject a narcotic. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew that if we made them physically dependent by programmed administration of morphine, say, and then they became physically dependent and we stopped giving it to them and they would go into withdrawal and that would be very aversive, at least humans described it as aversive, that if they then happened to press the lever in front of them and got an injection of morphine which relieved the withdrawal syndrome, what I guess we would call negative reinforcement, um, then uh, they would uh, learn to make this response. And lo and behold, they did. Well, uh, at the same time, at the University of Michigan, there were people, uh, Jim Weeks and Jerry Deneau and, and, and uh, Mo Sievers, who were setting up the same thing. So there, it was going on sure. in two different centers. It was sort of a zeitgeist phenomena. It, it, everything came together, the technology for doing it and, 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 and behavior and drugs. So and, the uh, time was right. The though. time was right, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, Now, is this some of the work you did at the University of Chicago when you were there? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I continued doing a great deal of drug self-administration. Let me just say as a behaviorist, it was very disappointing to me. What, why do I say this was disappointing? Mm -hmm. I found that all you had to do was pr surgically prepare the animals with a catheter, 
allow them availability to press a lever that would result in the delivery of drugs like morphine, cocaine, amphetamine, etc. And he didn't have to have any, didn't have to do any behavioristic tricks at all to get them to do it. <laughs> I thought we were going to have to have some kind of past history that would be mm -hmm. unique, that would, w would make a drug serve as a reinforcer. And lo and behold, all you had to do was make them available. So he, he can hit anybody. You know, right, what you're exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but, I, but what happened because of that was that my career as a behavior analyst was sort of diverted into pharmacology because I marched through all the pharmacopoeia looking to see which drugs would and which drugs <laughs> wouldn't serve as reinforcers and what was different about their pharmacology that might explain why some did and some didn't. Mm -hmm. And even further, some drugs were aversive and animals would learn to press a lever to terminate the injection of them. And so for maybe 15, 18 years, or 15 years, I, I, I sort of delved more into the pharmacology uh, uh, and, and the behavior analysis aspects of it were diverted because the pharmacology was so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so you became addicted to? I became addicted <laughs> to drugs, absolutely, <laughs> and, and, and you know, spent all my time uh, uh, looking at different kinds of drugs. But I have to say that, that even during that period of time, I recognized that, that uh, uh, we could, we could that, that the drugs were powerful, but uh, not immutable. <laughs> there were behavioral uh, interventions that we could use that would alter their reinforcing properties, and that we did a great deal of studies on those. Well, uh, what now? You came to NIDA in 1968. Is that no? I oh, no, no. I came to I came to the University of Chicago in 68. Oh, okay. Excuse me. And, and there, as I say, the first thing that I was charged with doing was helping Jerry Jaffe set up the Illinois Drug Abuse Treatment Program, mm -hmm. and so I got I um, got involved in setting up methadone maintenance treatment programs, mm -hmm. um, therapeutic communities, and things of this sort. And uh, this was a very important experience for me because it, it brought me back in contact with the problem of human, di human addiction and allowed me to uh, begin to explore how we might behaviorally intervene there. So this uh, was real applied work. Absolutely, doing, right? absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. At the same time, I was developing my animal lab back at the university. I was doing mm -hmm. both things at the same time. And uh, then uh, I realized, well, why not set up a human lab and begin to study uh, drugs of abuse in humans? And uh, uh, I did that with my students. And uh, mm -hmm. so we started to do drug self-administration studies in, in people who were using drugs on the street anyway. We mm -hmm. never used naive people, of course, but uh, people who were uh, uh, already drug abusers. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume you found about the same sorts of things you had found with the... Uh, with the well, yes and no. The um, uh, uh, humans are interesting because you can, of course, uh, uh, do all the things you can with animals. Uh, well, that's not true. Obviously, there are ethical mm -hmm. constraints, but I mean, you, mm -hmm. they, they have all the abilities to do mm -hmm. the, any study you do in animals. But in addition, uh, you can, they also have uh, verbal behavior. And although, uh, <laughs> at first, I can remember the first time at, I guess it would have been a behavioral pharmacology society meeting, which was a hotbed of uh, behavior analysts who were applying that to pharmacology. I went and I talked about giving humans mood scales. <laughs> they looked at me as if I'm, you know, what kind of heretic was I? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, as I pointed out to them, I didn't have to make any presumption about anything other than the fact that when we gave people certain drugs, their behavior changed in the way that they made check marks on a piece of paper in response to, I feel more angry, or I feel more this or that on a one mm -hmm. to 10 scale. And I didn't have to make any presumption about whether or not they were telling me the truth. I was interested in the functional relationship between, their, between the drug that they were given and the changes that they mm -hmm. th that, that uh, made in terms of their behavior mm -hmm. in checking off these adjective <laughs> checklists and so forth, uh, but they thought I had uh, <laughs> really I had sold out <laughs> I had sold out right. <laughs> but uh, 
Well, do you feel animal research is relevant to human psychology? There is no question about it. Absolutely oh. no question about it. Uh, we, you know, in my own field where we are interested in, in addiction, animal research has been of the utmost uh, uh, importance mm -hmm. and um, uh, has made major, major contributions to our understanding of the behavior, uh, be behavioral variables that affect it, uh, as well as uh, an understanding of the basic biology under, uh, that, that is uh, associated with, with drugs of abuse. So in both areas, I think it's been absolutely uh, so marvelous on, contri contributions. On a scale of one to four, with four being the high end, how would you rate it? Four. four. Okay. No question. No um, question. What uh, principles from the animal laboratory do you feel translate most readily to uh, your work? Well, first of all, just as a general rule, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and th th this, this may sound a little silly, but the the drugs which humans get into trouble with are drugs that will serve as reinforcers in animals. There's a couple of exceptions to that, mm -hmm. but, th but mm -hmm. I mean literally hundreds of drugs have been looked at. Drugs which are aversive have, uh, in humans are aversive in animals. Now what has that done? I'll tell you what it's done. It means that in a book like uh, the, the, the Bible of Pharmacology, which is Goodman and Gilman, in the chapter on addiction, they talk about drugs in there as reinforcers. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine that? Great. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, here, you know, this is the bedrock of of, of medical pharmacology. They mm -hmm. recognize the fact that that drugs of abuse can best be understood in terms of their ability to engender drug-seeking behavior and to maintain this. Uh, uh, they, 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 they have adopted the terminology and the conception that these drugs serve as reinforcers. Now, the, the fact is that if you accept that a drug is a reinforcer, or, or can serve as a reinforcer, uh, and in the same way that food can serve as a reinforcer in water, then that leads you to say, well, can we use some of the other, the, the, the many of the things that have been found with uh, food and water as reinforcers, uh, the variables that affect them, how do they affect drugs as reinforcers? And it turns out that you can use all the same schedules of reinforcement with drugs. You can use uh, any, any of the kinds of manipulations that you would use to, uh, that have been shown to affect food-maintained behavior, affect drug-maintained behavior. And the importance of that is, one of the major things that is of importance, is that it makes you rethink something. And that is, if you define addiction as, the, as sort of, and this, the, I'm using the terms of, that WHO and, and clinicians use, and that is a compulsion to seek out and to take the drug. I would translate that into behavior which is maintained at high strength that would be, that would be not suppressed by uh, punishment or would, would be able to transcend long fixed ratios or long, you know, a, a great deal of be, uh, behavioral requirements in the contingency. If you translate it that way, then if you look at schedules of reinforcement and how they affect drugs, you have to realize that it's the schedule that gives rise to, to this compulsive strength behavior, mm -hmm. not the drug per se. Mm -hmm. okay. And so it, it's, you know, we can talk about cocaine being this terrible drug of addiction, but the fact of the matter is if people have it on an FR1, they're not going up around beating people up the side of the head or they're not doing mm -hmm any of these things, uh, they are, they would simply take the drug. Now they get in trouble for other reasons. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, they might overdose and die. But my point is that the compulsive drug-seeking behavior is not so much the drug as it is the schedule of availability. And that's something behavior analysts know something about. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a couple more questions about applied programs. Sure. Uh, uh, have you done other, well first, going back to the, uh, the Chicago uh, yes. treatment program, uh, ha do you feel that program has been successful? Does it still exist? Uh, well, <coughs> I think that th there are a couple of things. Um, when we first started in the treatment of drug addiction in this country, it was fairly limited to heroin addiction. And further, the people who came in for treatment were older, 
and they had become addicts, heroin addicts, after the Second World War or after the Korean War. And in the area of the city that I was dealing with, these were primarily African Americans. I would say to you that they were very different than some of the addicts which we deal with today. Uh, when they came back from the Second World War or even Korea, I believe, people who were being discharged from the Army were members of what was called then the 5220 Club. You were given $20 a week for your mustering out for 52 weeks. Well, if you went back and you lived with your family and jobs were not readily available, $20 was enough money to get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. If you were, had time on your hands and money in your pocket and heroin was coming into the neighborhood, it was an ideal uh, circumstance for individuals to experiment with heroin and some of them went on to becoming addicted. These people did not have the amount of what I would call uh, concomitant psychopathology than some of the people we see today. So when I first started, we saw people who were older, who wanted to stop using drugs. They, th many of them, had, having been in the Army, uh, had some skills, although during the time they were heroin addicts, their skills were primarily, you know, <laughs> boosting things from stores and fast money artists who will take all the change and that kind of thing. But they came into, the, came into treatment. We could work with them. And at that time also, the economy was burgeoning and jobs were available. So what we could do is we could set up some contingencies, and that is if you were drug-free, uh, we would provide you with heroin. I'm sorry, we would provide you with methadone, say, for example, to, to decrease your need for heroin and adjust the dose of methadone. And if you didn't take heroin, we would, for a period of time, then we would say, okay, we will assist you in getting a job. And we were able to get them employment. And the biggest predictor in terms of their success was whether or not they found something to do that was meaningful to them. Because if you got time on your hands, my grandmother knew this, mm -hmm. time, <laughs> Idle time is the, uh, uh, what was the phrase, you know? Oh, the, uh, the devil finds work, to, uh, has, finds work for idle hands is oh, one right. way I've heard it. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Idle hands are the tools of the devil, she right. would say. Well, you know, it's just that, it, basically that was true, I, and I believe it is true. If you don't have alternative reinforcers to engage behavior, then people will, if they've had a history of using drugs, will go back to drug use. Uh, so I think we were very successful in the beginning because the, time, the people were, were appropriate for treatment and jobs were available and so forth. Today, I think we're running into a slightly different situation, and that is, that first of all, jobs are not readily available. Secondly, a lot of the people that we see have other forms of mental problems, uh, significant depression, significant uh, numbers of them uh, are what were called antisocial personality with a long history of criminal kinds of activities and so forth. But I have to say that here at the Addiction Research Center with some of my younger behavior analyst friends, we have, we're setting up programs mm -hmm. in our treatment and we can, through the judicious use of reinforcing what we call clean urines, because we can now do urine tests. They come in and give us a urine and a sample and we can test it and immediately know whether or not mm -hmm. they have met the contingency of not taking a drug. And if they have not, we can reinforce them with, with uh, certificates which mount up and they are then able to purchase things that their counselor and they feel will help them to find things that are alternatives to drug taking. Like a so. sort of a sophisticated token economy exactly in other words. Exactly right. Yes. It, out yeah. in the real world. And, and they're and not inpatients, they're, they're outpatients. And yeah, that it's was a token going to be my next system. question is what has been going on here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long have these programs been? Uh, well, we're actually we're actually, um, we're, we're actually just getting the data from from the first uh, group of people that we've been running. In this mm -hmm. case, we have have individuals who are part of a methadone maintenance treatment mm -hmm. program. But unlike when I began, not only do they use heroin, they use cocaine, they use PCP, they use Valium, uh, and mm -hmm. many of them smoke marijuana. That's a given. Uh, so. We give them methadone, and that may decrease their, their propensity to take heroin, but it doesn't do anything for their cocaine use, their PCP use, et cetera. So now what we have targeted 
is to start with, we have a group of people who are uh, taking, who are, have been using cocaine, and they continue to use it even when we put them on methadone, and then we apply the contingencies. We watch them for five weeks, and they've continued to use cocaine even though they've stopped using heroin, uh, and at that point, we match two people. Uh, if you had used cocaine during that five-week period and I had, then I might go into the contingent group and you might be my yoked control. Now, of course, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. you don't know this, and sure. uh, that there's a yoked control. But when I come in, and the first time I have a clean urine, it doesn't have any cocaine in it, I get a certificate that's worth $2.50. And you get one, too. But it doesn't matter whether your urine is clean or not. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the next time, if I have a second one in a row that's clean, it's three dollars that I get. If the third one in a row is clean, it's three fifty. So having stringing together clean urines results in increases in the value or the voucher that you get. And what we have been able to show so far, and, and this is preliminary analysis, is about forty to fifty percent of the people or in the contingent group, will give us 12 to 16 weeks of drug-free urines, cocaine-free mm -hmm. urines. Whereas in the non-contingent group, they're getting all the mm, certificates, et cetera, 10% uh, of them have stopped. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it, contingencies yeah. work. <laughs> they work. <laughs> no surprise to behavior analysts, of course. <laughs> yeah, right. If you make it worthwhile to people, they will stop using drugs. But you have to make it worthwhile. What um, behavior and analytically related accomplishment are you most proud of? Well, I guess there's, th th there's one thing that I did very early in my career that has had a lot of mileage, um, and that is that I did a study uh, on drug tolerance. Now, what do I mean by drug tolerance? I mean that when you first give a drug, it has a big effect on behavior, and when you continue to give it, the effect gets less and less. And most people attributed that to a change in the biology of the organism. And as a, I thought that there might be more to it than that. And what I was able to show was that it was really behavioral variables that were responsible for some forms of tolerance. Not all tolerance, but some forms of tolerance. And by that I mean that if the general rule that we finally came out with is that if a drug disrupts the animal or the person's ability to meet the reinforcement contingencies, and the reinforcer is powerful enough, then they will learn to adapt to the presence of the drug to meet the reinforcement contingencies. But if the drug enhances their ability to meet the reinforcement contingencies, they won't develop tolerance to that. And so we did a number of studies showing that, that essentially, you could call it relearning or, you know, under the drug, in influence of the drug, gives rise to what could be called tolerance. And there's been now uh, many, 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 many studies of that by other people. So th I think that, uh, that that's, I think it was an importance because it came on very early in my career and it showed me that, that, that behavioral variables mm -hmm. w uh, were extremely important. In, in affecting pharmacolo the pharmacological actions of drugs. About what time would that? That would have been way back when I was a graduate student. Really? Yeah, My goodness. Yeah, um, yeah, that was back that when I was working in Joe Brady's lab at mm -hmm. the University of Maryland. And uh, then I continued those studies when I was at the University of Michigan and sort of came to the general conclusion in a paper that I published in, in the early 60s. And of course, the other, the other, other phenomena that I think has been most important to me is is demonstrating clearly that drugs of abuse serve as reinforcers. I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, have you had any occasion to work with groups of subjects, uh, either animal or human, where you are dealing with the people or animals as a group in a group contingency where the... Where the well, uh, the, answer, the answer is is that I have not but we're planning to do something right now. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that I'm interested in, in the application of is what is called reciprocal couples counseling by, by applied behavior analysts. That is that if we, if we have people who are taking drugs and we can get them to bring in a significant other, 
and get them to agree. And uh, this is based upon work uh, being done at, at the University of Vermont by Steve Higgins and others. But they have been able to show that if you not only reinforce them in the way that I described previously with certificates that they can exchange for goods or services that are you know, helpful to them to find things other than drugs to turn them on, uh, that if their significant other can be taught to differentially reinforce them on the basis of whether or not their urines are clean, that guarantees that when they leave your treatment facility, that at least for the period of time that they're with their significant other in the day, that, the, the, that they're being reinforced for being abstinent. Mm -hmm. And so in this sense, we are um, uh, using others. Now, how do you get to groups from that? Well, one of the tragedies is that in the hardcore drug users we're dealing with, many of them don't have any significant others. They've burnt their bridges. They've stolen from them too many times, they've, you know, et cetera. And so what we are thinking about doing uh, is to get groups of, of, of patients themselves to, to buddy up, and both of them have to have clean urines in order for them to be reinforced. So now <laughs> it's, it would be sort of a group contingency. In right. which we, and, and so that's that means that when, I, when they leave, if, if we're the two that are buddied up, I'm going to be watching you and say, hey, you know, you've got to cool it. Don't go over there, because you know if you go over there, there are very potent environmental cues that are going to bring you back into using drugs. So stay over here with me, and we'll stay out of the neighborhood where we used to go to take drugs, et cetera. Right. And, but we can socialize together, OK? And maybe, you know. You, uh, this is just starting, so you have Yes, to, you yes. Have we're, to just, okay. we're just beginning to do that. Okay. Uh, in any of your work, have you experienced any failures of behavior <laughs> analytic principles? Well, I guess the answer to that is that, uh, yes, there are, you know, I, 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 I but I, I don't failures think it's. Failures of principles. No, no, absolutely not. I think failures have occurred when, we, when I have misapplied the principles. One, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of the green spoon effect. Yes. <laughs> well, very For our early viewers, on. could you describe the green sure, spoon Sure, I will, green absolutely. Green the green spoon, as I remember it, and this has been many, many years ago, was uh, trained at the University of Chicago by Carl uh, uh, Rogers in non-directive psychotherapy. And in non-directive psychotherapy, all you were supposed to do is say, mm-hmm, or yes, and that was not supposed to direct the verbal flow of the client that you were seeing. Well, Greenspoon said, I think it does. <laughs> so he set up an experiment in which he had, he told people they were being, being given a vocabulary test or something and decided that every time they used a, uh, a noun or, I don't know, an adverb, he would say, mm-hmm. And he was able to show that the frequency of adverb emission <laughs> by this uh, uh, subject would go up when he just said, mm-hmm. So I decided that I was going to do that, but not with adverbs, but with uh, statements about the University of Maryland. And so I s set up this experiment. And they would say, um, you know, it's tough to get a date here at the University of Maryland. And I would say, mm-hmm. And for the next three hours, all they would talk about are girls, and <laughs> but I, because what I was reinforcing was such a complex yeah, uh, right. a, a verbal response, and a portion of which was not what, now maybe if I had stayed at this for, you know, weeks mm -hmm. and weeks and weeks, we could have gradually refined it and gotten out statements about the University of Maryland, but, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of a selection of the appropriate yeah. unit of behavior that you can reinforce. And, and I had obviously <laughs> selected such a complex one that it was just <laughs> impossible. Uh, so there, but, but as far as the principles are concerned, no. No, just in misapplication. Well, I think this next question also relates to what you've just told me about problems you encountered that aren't addressed by behavior analytics. That's principles. correct, yes. And yeah. this verbal behavior, I guess you would say, would be exactly. anything else like that? You think? Well, I think that you know one of the things that we that we have to, as behavior analysts, admit and to be willing to deal with, and that is that there are organisms who, by virtue of disordered biology, 
may be more difficult to bring under the control of the, of the reinforcement contingencies that are effective with most people. And, uh, and this is true of animals as well, of course, uh, but we see it most clearly in the case of humans. And as a consequence, I think that sometimes I do get a little bit concerned with sort of the polarization between people who are interested in underlying biology and biological differences and those who are interested in, in the application of behavioral principles. I don't personally have no conflict there because you know I'm, I'm interested in solutions of problems and will use whatever I have to to solve problems. So I, I can remember, for example, the uh, uh, some of the controversy about whether or not we should medicate people versus try to set up uh, token economy systems for all schizophrenics. Well, I can tell you that we don't have enough behavior analysts and never will to have token economy systems. And more importantly, individuals who are properly medicated, or say schizophrenic, uh, are more amenable to coming under contingency control than those who are not. And why not use both? There's no, con there's no conflict there. Uh, but I, I, unfortunately, there are some people think, may think that there are. It has to be either or. That's right. No, it's not either or. No. Uh, now you've set up behavioral programs where you've trained people to uh, administer these contingencies. Okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, after you've set up these programs and gone off and left them to do the many other things you must do, mm -hmm. uh, do you find a great deal of drift in these programs? I think that. Uh, I think that that is always a mm -hmm. problem, always a problem. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we have failed at, uh, at least I can say I've failed at, and that is how do you make, how do you make, well, two things. First of all, I can tell you that we have failed to sell the principles of behavior, behavior analysis in the field of drug abuse treatment to the vast majority of the treatment practitioners out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm talk I, I give a talk, if we're so smart, how come we ain't rich? Uh, and by that I mean if we're so smart, how come the principles that we know to be effective have not been wholesalely adopted by treatment practitioners? And so that's one issue, is getting them to uh, do that. But more to, uh, germane to your uh, question, that is, how do you maintain their behavior? And I think that that we have stopped our behavior analysis <laughs> with, with you know, looking at the client in some uh, therapeutic setting and setting up a con uh, people who can who can appropriately reinforce them. But what what reinforces them? Okay. What are the reinforcers for the therapist? And um, I know that several of my colleagues right now are directly addressing that by setting up reinforcement contingents for successful behavior on the part of the therapist. Going back to that first comment you made about uh, why is it, uh, I, w I would like to ask, why do you feel it's so hard to sell the principles to the practitioners? Well, a couple things. First of all, I think we, f we talk a funny language and we are, and that, that may be not well understood. Uh, I think it's, the language is important, however, and, and because if we start talking common sense language and reduce reinforcers to rewards inaccurately, that then it, 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 you can get into a great deal of sloppiness and, and that's not going to work. But I think the biggest difficulty which we've had is that in the field of drug abuse treatment, we have many people who are the leaders in it, who themselves at one time were drug users and they have gone to some therapeutic program and found that they have stopped using drug. They are bonded to that program and to that approach in a way that is very, very difficult to shake their faith. Now, the fact is that they've stopped using drugs. Why? I have no idea. What it, was it the program, what, uh, was it other things? I have no idea. But it's very difficult, for, even though you show them that, yes, okay, this approach, you were successful. But now you're using it, and only with 40% of the people or 30% of the people is it being, uh, uh, you're being successful. At the end of a year, you've lost 50% of them, they've walked away. And of those that have stayed, only 30% are really doing well. 
uh, they still have this, this belief in what they're doing. And they look, and, and the intermittent reinforcement of even 30% is enough <laughs> to maintain their behavior. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to get people to, 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 to change. And one of the things that I've tried to suggest back when I was the director of NIDA is to, is to essentially set up on a grander scale uh, contingencies, and that is to rather than have programs evaluated uh, as or inspected as they are now uh, to see whether or not they comply with the paper and pencil rules, let's look at outcome and publish outcome. And if the states find that treatment program A over here is doing better than this treatment program, then they'll give their contract to this one over here. And treatment B, program B may say, well, how can we improve? Well, if they even if they want to improve, then I think we have an opportunity for behavior analysts to move in. But as long as they can get by, uh, being supported by the state and by the federal government for very um, uh, relatively ineffective treatment, uh, they, they, there's there's no reason for them to change. When these programs do start to fall apart or to drift, uh, what is the nature of the drift? What happens? Uh, when well, in in the I think there are several things. Um, first of all, I think that there's a lack, uh, that, that, that what happens is, that, for example, if you have contingencies and you're going to say, mm -hmm. well, you know, if they, if, they, if they have a dirty urine, something is going to happen. By that I mean mm -hmm. a urine that, that contains an illicit mm -hmm. drug. Um, and they come in and say, oh, to the, to the, to the counselor, mm -hmm. you know, that's not right. I know that I was clean. You know that I've been clean. And the counselor says, well, you know, maybe he is telling you the truth, <laughs> and they, you know, okay. Th th there's that type of thing that 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 adherence to the true principles of contingencies are lost. Or, well, you know, I would I would have stayed clean, but I ran into these guys, and it'll never happen again. <laughs> but if I don't get, you know, uh, it, that's the kind of thing that takes place. Um, and drug using people, at least the clients that I deal with can be very, very manipulative and are very clever in, in okay. terms of stories and excuses and so forth. Good liars. In oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Have you experienced any ethical questions or objections about, tra about changing or controlling behavior? Oh. Back in Chicago, uh, Izzy Gold Diamond and, and uh, strange with that name and the fact that he's Jewish, uh, we, were, we were picketed, we were um, uh, threatened. Uh, as Nazi doctors who were bringing, you know, <laughs> Nazi Izzy Goldman, Izzy Goldman, Nazi, Nazi doctor. doctor. Yeah, I mean, sure. it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm German, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, it, it, and and it was because of the issue of mind control, <laughs> and this was a group of of uh, both students and and others who who felt that that our attempt to control behavior was basically incompatible with the with the principles of, of, uh, of democracy and, mm -hmm. and, and freedom and so forth. And uh, uh, I've also run into, into ethical questions with, um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the late 60s when I first started using methadone and applying mm -hmm. contingencies to that, uh, that, that they had to take the methadone, they had to do this, they had to, you know, mm -hmm. in order to get the reinforcers that we made available through the treatment program. Um, there was a great deal of resentment on the part of some of the African American clients that I had because they essentially said, why should I adhere to your white hunky values <laughs> uh, and, and, and so forth. And my only comment about that was, hey, these are the contingencies under which you can get what I have to offer. If you don't want it, go down to 43rd Street. There's a place down there that people sell heroin, and they have different contingencies for getting the heroin. I can only offer you what you mm -hmm. know what is what is allowed for me to offer you, and and under the conditions which are going to, in the long run, uh, make your life better. But if you don't want to take it, I mean that's that's your decision. You know? sure. <laughs> so, but there. I also must say that we're running into a problem now um, uh, and, uh, with the issue of uh, studies of drugs of abuse in humans. There are those that question the ethics of that, and um, that's a separate problem from behavior analysis, but is one that is uh, uppermost in my mind because 
I think it is um, it is demeaning to individuals to say if you tell them all of the risks, mm -hmm. they know what they are getting at so that they're fully informed and that they are competent to make the decision for someone else to say it's unethical uh, for for you to for them to be able to participate in this type of experiment. I think it's uh, it's demeaning to them. Uh, there is no evidence, no evidence whatsoever, that giving drugs of abuse, even to naive people, in a laboratory setting, generalizes so they're going to go out and become addicts and run amok on the streets. When there's absolutely no evidence that this will take place, because they're very, very different mm -hmm. circumstances. They don't have the behavioral repertoire to go out on the street and to score and to get drugs. They don't have those associations. Uh, if they come in here and receive a small dose of a psychomotor stimulant drug like amphetamine, I've never, never, never over 40 years I've been in this business, I've seen anyone who has become addicted because mm -hmm. of exposure in a laboratory. Uh, have you experienced any uh, ethical objections about using animals in research? Oh, yes. Um, I have been hung in effigy many times uh, by members of PETA and other so-called animal rights organizations. Um, I, my, particularly when I was the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, I was very uh, adamant in my support of animal research. And as a matter of fact, um, when PETA succeeded in getting uh, uh, Cornell University to uh, uh, stop certain research that was going on there, I, without even asking whether I had the authority to do that, told them that uh, if there were any kind of interference of this sort, that I would see to it that they never got another federal government grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, because <laughs> you can't, you know, I don't know whether I had the right to do that or not, but I did, and uh, uh, got away with it. and, and when that news got out, uh, PETA and various other organizations were very much on my case. <laughs> uh, PETA is a people for the ethical treatment of animals. Correct. Right. That's correct. Okay. And I think that, you know, I think where I part company is that anyone who says that a cat is a dog is a rat, that, that uh, is a boy, uh, that is that all, all living organisms have inherently the same value and the same, uh, the same rights. Uh, it's just philosophically, I think, uh, absurd, and uh, I strongly disagree with it. If you carry that to extreme, you'd be like the Jane cast in, in India going around with no clothes because That's you might right. crush a flea or something. Exactly, like that. exactly, yes. Have you encountered administrative resistance in introducing these programs? Uh, yeah, yes, and, and, and in, in the following sense, and that is that um, um, well, uh, th this is a strange answer, but sometimes people right now, both uh, some of the administrators, uh, not here, but in, in general, and uh, uh, people on the street object to our g using positive reinforcers to get people to stop using drugs. And they say, why should you be giving them something for doing what is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, here I am. I've never used drugs. Why don't you give those reinforcers to me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so there's a real resentment uh, on the part of many people in the community and administrators uh, having trouble with reinforcing people with things that maybe other people in the community who are not drug users mm -hmm. do not have and would like to have. And it is, it is a bit of a problem, and I understand it. But, but um, uh, it, I can only say that that would you rather put them in, you'd rather put them in jail, which will cost us about five times as much as even the most lavish kind of of reinforcement, uh, uh, positive reinforcement we might give them for becoming drug free. Yeah. Uh, this problem is the, the old moralistic view, I guess. Of looking That's at right. Behavior. That's right. Yep. Um, well, uh, and you've already answered, I believe, my other question about this resistance, and that's about subjects resistance. You mentioned the, the, yeah. the uh, people, why should I do this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, was there any event in your career that dramatically changed its direction? 
Well, I think the opportunity to go to Chicago and to work in an applied setting uh, was certainly a, a major, major change for me. If it had not been for that, if I had stayed at the University of Michigan, in, in, I might have done a little bit of human research, but nothing in the way of uh, applied research the way that I have and uh, uh, continue to do. Um, and I'm very thankful to Jerry Jaffe and the people that, uh, that gave me the opportunity to, to get really immersed in the, in the practical aspects of the drug abuse field. Uh, what do you consider to be your most significant or influential publication? Oh, gee willikers. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> a textbook that I wrote with Travis Thompson. It was the first textbook, and it was called Behavioral Pharmacology, first textbook in, in the field of behavioral pharmacology. And uh, I w gratified to say it was published in, gee, 68, sometime around then. Uh, I uh, ran into uh, Don Cherick, and he said, you know, I still have my students read this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've toyed with the idea of revising it, et cetera. But uh, in it, what we essentially tried to do was to point out that you can study behavior and drugs in the same way as you can study anything, any other, uh, uh, well, in pharmacology, you take out a little bit of a, of a of the intestine of a rat and you hang it up and you make it contract <laughs> and you put drugs in the bath around it and you see how that alters the contraction. Then you wash the drug out and you put another concentration of the drug in and you see what happens. Well, w in our book we simply pointed out that you can study behavior in the same way and that you allow days to go by while the drug is washed out of the animal <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you come back and give him another dose. But you control the behavior in the same way as you control the behavior of this isolated uh, strip of intestine uh, mm -hmm. that pharmacologists had classically dealt with. And uh, so I think that, that many people f found it really uh, philosophically very important and, uh, and I think it was a major impetus, if I may be so immodest, in terms of the establishment of the field of behavioral pharmacology. Uh, what, at this point, do you consider to be the overall significance of your work? Um, well, I guess I would say that it is the application of the principles of behavior analysis to the applied problem of drug addiction. And there's just no question that, that, that I feel so gratified to have been in the right place at the right time to be able to make contributions in that area. And uh, it, it just... It never ceases to amaze me when I go to s psychiatric conferences and other places that people there talk about drugs as reinforcers, talk about the schedule of availability, et cetera. It, it's had an impact, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you feel the public, the overall public, the person in the street, uh, uh, has uh, their opinion of behavior analysis has changed over the years? Uh, yeah, I, th I think that it has, and, uh, uh, and probably one of the principal reasons is that I think that uh, uh, things like the application of principles of behavior analysis to education, uh, such as the so-called teaching machines that came along and, and uh, et cetera, have helped to, s to sell the notions to uh, a broader base of people. I mean, certainly, certainly, uh, I, I, I interact a lot with school teachers because my, my sister's children, um, all four of them, teach uh, public school. And, uh, you know, they all talk in the terms of behavior analysis. I mean, you know, now, and, and that certain, that's not the general public, but it is much yeah. closer to the general public than, than university uh, types who, like myself, who do research in the area. And I, so I think in that sense it has. In I a positive direction. In a positive direction, yes, absolutely. I think also, though, that there continues to be uh, uh, some apprehens apprehension. I mean, 1984 came and went. And, uh, <laughs> and nothing <laughs> and, uh, terrible happened. And nothing terrible has happened, right. Uh, How about mainstream psychology's view, view of it? Uh, behavior analysis. Do you feel that's true? I think it's been, yes. I think it's uh, the past few years with the rise of cognitive psychology, I think it's been devastating mm -hmm. to, to uh, many universities' uh, programs of, of psychology 
or um, uh, to the to the uh, detriment of, uh, of behavior analysis. I, I, it, what's interesting, though, is that I think that behavior analysis has uh, spread. I mean, the amazingly, I mean, the School of Social Work at the University of Chicago had, you know, really good applied behavior analysts. Um, and you find them in departments of education, you find them in departments of psychiatry, you find them mm -hmm. in behavioral medicine departments all over the place, but less in psychology <laughs> departments. <laughs> so they've spread their tentacles yeah, out yeah. Into, the, into the applied areas very, very well. My fear is that without the wellspring of, of, of research from the classic depar psychology departments, that the, the real progress will not be continued to be made. I mean, you know, I would like to go on record as saying that although, you know, I think that we've made great progress, that there is a lot of fundamental uh, behavior analysts, uh, behavior analytic research that's, that needs to be done and continue to be Absolutely. done. You know. Uh, could you contrast how what it was like to be at the APA meetings as a behavior analyst back in the uh, say 60s as compared to today? Well, well, let me just tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story that's a little bit off the sides of that, but that is that at the University of Michigan, when I was there, I had a courtesy appointment in the psychology department. John Falk, who was also a behavior analyst, was in the medical school. There were 212 people in the psychology department at the University of Michigan. 212. <laughs> and uh, Bill McKeechee was the department chairman at that time. He wanted to go up to full strength of 300. He never made it. <laughs> I remember 212 psychologists. And the luncheons that they would have sat 10 people at a table. And no matter what time we would go, now there were 212, there would be 21 tables with 10 people at them and John Falk and I sitting alone at the last <laughs> one. That's how behavior analysts felt <laughs> in, this was in, in mainstream er psychology. This was in the early 60s. This was in the er, mid early 60s, yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and I can tell you, they were very hostile towards <laughs> us. I <laughs> bet you. <laughs> Goodness, that would have been terrible. <laughs> right. well, we often laugh about that. We'd go early and everybody would sit at the other tables and we would still be alone there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I guess, actually, though, uh, being somewhat of a renegade, I mean, I think it, it, it really was good. <laughs> uh, okay, but what about APA? Do you think? I think more or less the same feeling. I mean, mm. and uh, uh, I think that we've gone through a period of, of uh, in which behavior analysis was uh, in, uh, has, has really, really risen uh, in terms of its ascendancy within APA. I think. At the present period of time, as I mentioned before, I think that uh, the cognitive psychology and others have, have, have risen uh, and at the moment enjoy sort of the, the, mm -hmm. the main, uh, the, they're, they're in the spotlight right now. <laughs> it's their turn. <laughs> That's right, yes. If you had your academic and professional life to do over again, is there anything you'd do differently? Wow. You know, I really don't think so. Uh, there are probably things I would have taken greater advantage of from this vantage point, but, but I have been extremely lucky, and I know it. And, you know, for all those people who think that, I mean, one plans their career, I happen to have been fortunate enough to just follow my nose where there were interesting problems and say, hey, you know what? Well, I want that. I'm going to go and do that, and uh, I've been lucky enough to have been able to do that and also been reasonably successful. How would you advise a student who wanted to go into a career like yours, say a high school student or young mm -hmm. college person, uh, why would they prepare themselves per personally and professionally? Right. Well, I think first of all that, that uh, I think that a a solid background in, in science is of, is of the utmost importance these days. There's just no question that, that I think in the future that we're not going to have quite the, as I mentioned before, the dichotomy between biology and, and, and behavior. Uh, I like the term that my ex-professor, uh, my old professor, uh, Joe Brady uses, and that is behavioral biology. And I like to link those two. So I, I would suggest that I think that in the future, given the ascendancy of, of things like the genetic contribution uh, to, the, to 
the determinants of behavior, um, that it's going to be very important for people to at least be able to understand those things, not that they necessarily are going to work in them, to, be, to have a comprehension of it. And it is complex, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> I have difficulty reading my, my youngest daughter's high school textbook on these <laughs> topics these days. Well, but that's probably I think a good that's thing. one thing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and so, I, so I think a solid background in science uh, and, 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 a, and, a, and, and, a, and a keen appreciation for the fact that, that uh, ultimately, no matter what we do in the way of more molecular studies and biological studies, the, organis the, behavior, the organism is always right. <laughs> the behavior is the reality, and the biology that people are studying has to, has to be correlated and predictive of those behaviors or else it's wrong. <laughs> Couldn't happen otherwise. That's right. That's right. Uh, do you feel there are adequate opportunities for minorities and women in behavior analysis? Well, I guess what I would say is that, that I think that there are there's, I, I'm pleased with the, with the efforts that are being made to get more minority uh, uh, students and women into behavior analysis. I think that the problem is not the, at the graduate school level or even the undergraduate level. I think tragically that it is, exists before then. And I think that we have, as, as, uh, who have an interest in that area, have to recognize that we really have to start high school programs if we're going to have an impact. Because you don't feel there are any roadblocks, do you? I don't think that there are roadblocks. No, no, no. I think, I think I'm very proud. Of, I think of, of of psychology in general uh, as as being uh, very concerned about these issues. Whom do you think you have influenced? Gee whiz. Well, I guess I would say that you know there. I've been uh, fortunate to have some really good uh, students. Um, uh, and I would like to think that I've influenced uh, them. Uh, for, uh, foremost in my thinking about that, of course, is my wife, uh, Chris Ellen Johansson, who got her degree in the University of Chicago in 1972, and there were other students there at that point, Marion Fishman, who uh, we did the first human cocaine research together since Sigmund Freud did it back <laughs> at the turn of the century. And she's now a professor at Columbia University, uh, and others, uh, many, many others. But uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Robert Balster, who was a postdoc with me uh, at the University of Chicago, I think would probably say that uh, he would say that I had a great influence on him. <laughs> and, uh, what groups of people would you like to influence? Well, I'll tell you. Um, I am very much interested in influencing the treatment and prevention practitioners out there today. I want to figure out how we can better sell the, 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 the fruits of behavior analysis and in its application to in the applied field, how we can get it adopted and, and maintained in, mm -hmm. the, in the behavioral repertoire of therapists. Not necessarily to the exclusion of other things. I'm not an un unrealistic, but I mean, but that should be a part of of, of, of uh, and, and, and for me, it should be the conceptual framework in which treatment is done. But, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, that's something we really have to work harder on. Uh, do you use behavior analysis in your everyday life? Yep. With yes, your family? I do. Yes, I do. Your friends, associates? Yep. Yes, I do. Coworkers? I think, uh, to be honest, uh, I, I don't, well, first of all, I don't make a distinction between my work and my everyday life. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, and I, I, it's all one and the same. Man. Do you think behavior analysis has been successful in solving human problems? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, but I think that I think that its potential has not been realized mm -hmm. uh, nearly to the extent that it could be and should be. Uh, but certainly, certainly the 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 uh, uh, both from the viewpoint of the conceptual way of attacking human problems, which I think is one of the major things we have to offer. The framing of the issue, the framing of the question, and then th thinking about how the principles that we know uh, to work already can be applied to that problem. Uh, I think we've, we've done marvelous things, but could do much more. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and on a scale of one to four, with four again being the high point, uh, how would you rate its success? Well, I would rate its success as all, it, it depend, in two mm -hmm. ways. Its, its potential success, I was rated as four. I think okay. we know a lot of things. I think in terms of its practical success, it's been spotty. I think in the areas of education and certain oh. other areas, it's been, it's been highly successful. In my own area, I would say that it has not been nearly as successful as I would like it to be. Um, and I, so I'd have to give it a two. Okay. <laughs> but we're working on it. Right. We'll get it up to four. <laughs> now, yeah. can you think of any ways in which uh, behavior analysis could be used to improve the human condition where it's not now being used? Oh, yes. Um, I think, first of all, that you know, we have major problems of, of uh, uh, disadvantaged individuals. Uh, and I want to make it clear that I'm not talking about either racial or ethnic groups. I'm talking about people in general uh, who are disadvantaged and uh, who are going to schools which uh, are inadequate. Uh, I think that it would be very reasonable for us to use principles of behavior analysis to uh, help their, their parents, to help them in terms of their adjustment to school, uh, and to, uh, uh, to, to make the school experience uh, a, a more positively reinforcing one, in thereby encouraging them to stay in school and so forth. I, I, I also, I think that the issues of, of violence in our communities is, is something that behavior analysts should be addressing and, and could, uh, but it requires a, a more global uh, ability to control contingencies than currently exist. Mm -hmm. uh, Are you uh, optimistic about the future of behavior analysis? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Scale of one to four. Oh, I would say that I, I I would honestly say that that it will continue to thrive and survive with ups and downs, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd put it at four. Okay. Do you see any one individual on the horizon who might replace Skinner? Ah, boy, that's a. I, I would have to say, no, I don't see one individual. Mm -hmm. I see some really very important young people who are coming along who are uh, uh, doing things in, in the application of, of Skinnerian principles, and principles of behavior analysis, I really should say. Um, but I, you know, I mentioned before the, uh, the, the person who, who, who had a major impact on me was, was, was Jack Findlay. Uh, who I think after Skinner, his, his conception of the modi operant uh, uh, was, was of the utmost importance. Tragically, he is no longer in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel to ask you uh, your reasons for being, why are you optimistic about behavior analysis? Well, uh, first of all, I think that unquestionably that if you want to solve any human problem, you're talking about a behavioral problem. And if you're talking about a behavioral problem, the principles of behavior analysis are applicable to it and they work. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't I be <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> optimistic? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> what direction do you think the field will take in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I think some of the, some of the things that, that I see that are, are interesting are, are some of the complexities. Um, some of the research that is that Mary Sidman has done and is continuing to do on th issues like stimulus equivalence that I, I think uh, will be of the utmost importance in understanding behaviors that on the face of it look a little inexplicable. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do these things have control over behavior that have never been linked with it? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I think that we're going to get into those types of issues. I think the second thing is a better understanding of historical influences. That is that that. Uh, uh, how the cumulative impact of, of environmental contingencies influence outcomes of behavior. Um, we have done, I think, very well with looking at current contingencies, but individuals don't come into that at, at tabula rosa. They, they come into it with a behavioral history, and understanding that interaction is something that I think is going to be of the utmost importance. Most people don't seem to have a very clear idea of what science is all about. Could you help us clear up the confusion by giving us your definition of science? <laughs> Boy, that's interesting. What would I say science is? I guess it is, it is f first of all, uh, a 
orderly way of addressing a problem, uh, concept conceptualizing a problem, and uh, then uh, essentially the application of, of, of systematic uh, manipulation of, of some of the kinds of things that you may that you think may influence whatever it is that you're studying. And I think that the biggest thing is about science is, is, is it, the way that it makes you that conceptualize the problem and frame the question so that you can begin to, to see what the determinants of any particular phenomena are. How about technology? How would you distinguish that from science? Well, I think that I think first of all we should. I I, I think that techno technological advances are of extreme importance uh, and and allow science to progress. But I think that it is it is it, it shouldn't be confused with the way of thinking about mm. the problem, with the way of conceptualizing it. It is these are I think that these are simply tools that are make it possible for us to address and to see things and to measure and manipulate things which we couldn't previously but it's not science per se. What about the impact of science on your own life? How would, could you describe that? Science is generalized. Well, goodness, I mean, uh, over the, you know, over the period of time that, that, uh, that you and I have been alive, we've seen a lot of changes. <laughs> yes, <we laughs> you know, um, uh, t television, uh, the, uh, flights to outer space. I mean, uh, th these are, these are, I mean, these are just mind-boggling things that, that uh, uh, we could hardly conceptualize, e even if we had read H.G. Uh, uh, Wells and other <laughs> futuristic kind of science fiction writers. Uh, but I think, that, I think that one of the things that, that it has done is to, I, I, I think that the advances in medicine, the advances in public health, the advances in all of these things have given us a, uh, 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 reason for great optimism if we can, through the application of the principles of behavior analysis, get people to utilize these things appropriately for the good of everyone. Well, I think you probably answered my next question, which was to have been the impact of science on the world as a whole. You know? Yeah. Well, I think that, as I say, the you know, th th there are tragedies that are going on right now because of my interest in drug abuse. The, the issue of AIDS has been something that haunts me uh, in my dealing with clients in treatment and many of the subjects that come in for other studies I'm doing here at the ARC are HIV positive mm -hmm. because of their past history of drug use. Uh, and uh, I look at places like Africa. And the fact is that although the latest AIDS conference have indicated that we don't have an answer and it doesn't look like there's going to be a biological answer to this. The getting the AIDS virus depends upon behavior. <laughs> and, you know, if we could only, if we could only uh, uh, have better control of the, of the contingency so that we could aid, it, so that we could have an impact in this area, in areas like Africa and other places in the world where this dread disease is spreading. Because the only thing we can do right now is, is through behavioral change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you consider psychology to be a science? Oh, sure. Uh, do you think there can be psychology without science? Um, well, uh, not anything that I would want to be affiliated with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you consider, uh, what do you think the average person in the street's concept of science is? Um, probably more Star Wars than anything else. Uh, physics, I think, is what they think of as science. I think we have a hard time convincing people that, that psychology uh, can be a science because everybody knows how to control human behavior. Sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and which is why I insist upon purest language. Because if you, if you go down to common language to express yourself, you are then uh, going to open yourself up for arguments uh, based upon uh, non-controlled uh, observations which people have made and they think that they know the truth because of that. What do you think we can do about that? Well, I, 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 think, that, I think that the 
in general, I think that we have to improve the uh, science training in our, in our uh, uh, public school system. And, and I would certainly include uh, in that uh, the principles of behavior analysis. That's where it has to be taught. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we hey, appreciate it. It's been great to have your I, insights and experiences. I, 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 let me just say I'm really honored to uh, oh, have been asked well, to do this. Thank you. <laughs>